Welcome listeners. You are listening to a podcast from the Free People's Movement, out of Sweden. Episode 12. Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell and the Blackmail Business. In this episode, we will take a closer look at one of the many tools of the deep state. The Blackmail Business. If you are listening to the audio-only version of this podcast, make sure you follow us on YouTube and Rumble, as this episode contains some supporting graphics. So, seeing as the deep state probably has many different operations of this type, we will look at an example of this, using some familiar names and faces, just to illustrate the amount of control that the deep state has had. It might seem a bit complex, but as you will soon see, everything always ties back to the core of the deep state historically. Knut Agathon Wallenberg was a Swedish banker and politician, he was also a knight of the Order of the Seraphim. Wallenberg was Minister for Foreign Affairs 1914-1917, and member of the Riksdag's First Chamber, the Upper House, 1907-1919. Together with his wife, he created Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, which is one of the main contributors to the private university Stockholm School of Economics. Wallenberg was one of the founders of the Stockholm School of Economics, and is also seen as the founder of the community of Salzjobarden and an associated railroad. He also founded the British Bank of Northern Commerce in February 1912, while serving as the CEO of the Stockholm's Inskilda Bank. The British Bank of Northern Commerce was a joint venture by SEB and Landmannsbanken, today called Danske Bank, together with several other banks, including the Norwegian Central Bank, Bank de Commerce de Ellersofton, and Bank de Paris, Paribas. The purpose of the bank was to facilitate trade between the United Kingdom and Northern Europe. The bank financed Finland after the country achieved its independence from Russia in 1917-18, after the Russian Revolution, which of course had been orchestrated by the deep state. In October 1920, British Bank of Northern Commerce merged with C.J. Hambro and Sons, with the combined bank taking the name Hambro's Bank of Northern Commerce. In August 1921, the bank shortened its name to Hambro's Bank, in part because it did not want a name that was too limiting. Or maybe too obvious. Air Commodore, Sir Charles Jocelyn Hambro, was a British merchant banker and intelligence officer. Hambro was born into a banking family of Danish-Jewish origin which had settled in Dorset and the city of London in the early 19th century. He was the son of Sir Eric Hambro, a partner in C.J. Hambro and Sons. He was also a Conservative Member of Parliament, for Wimbledon between 1900 and 1907. He served for two years as an officer on the Western Front, in the First World War, until demobilization. After initially training with the Guarantee Trust Company in New York City, where he and his wife lived with Harry Morgan, he joined his family bank C.J. Hambro and Sons, playing a large part in its merger with the British Bank of Northern Commerce in 1920, to form the Hambro's Bank in 1921. In 1928, only 30 years old, Hambro was elected into the Directorate of the Bank of England, and between 1932 and 1933, he worked on establishing the Bank's Exchange Control Division, under the direction of Montague C. Norman, the Director of the Bank of England. In 1937 Hambro was asked to succeed Norman as Director, but according to the official version, he turned it down as he was suffering from oral cancer, which he would later recover from. At the outbreak of the Second World War, Hambro was placed in charge of activities in Scandinavia, arranging smuggling, intelligence networks and sabotage operations. After the fall of France in June 1940, Hambro was made a colonel on the general staff and was asked by Ronald Cross to join the Ministry of Economic Warfare, a cover organization for the Special Operations Executive, SOE. The SOE was charged with creating a spirit of resistance in occupied territories. Through his contact with Ebby Monk, an anti-Nazi journalist, Hambro linked up with the Danish resistance, and was knighted as a knight commander of the Order of the British Empire for his work, in 1941. Hambro refused to accept any wages for his military work during wartime. Maybe, just maybe, because of less paper trails. 
Between December 1940 and November 1941, Hambro was also in charge of overseeing the French, Belgian, German and Dutch sections of the SOE. From November 1941, he was also the deputy leader of the SOE for five months. In 1942 he succeeded in persuading the British and Norwegian organizations to form a planning commission, which was instrumental in devising Operation Grouse and Operation Swallow, important parts of the Norwegian heavy water sabotage missions. By this time, Hambro was on the executive committee of the SOE, and was promoted to Air Commodore. Roundel Palmer, now head of the SOE, appointed him to succeed Frank Nelson. His first major action as head of the SOE was to meet with Colonel William Joseph Donovan, the head of the OSS. Remember him from the previous episode? While Bill Donovan, the deep state operative who after his death was meant to take the fall for the murder of General Patton. Maybe just another coincidence. Later, a disagreement over actions in the Middle East led Hambro to resign in 1943. For the rest of the war, he acted as head of the British Raw Materials Mission in Washington, a cover for exchanging information and technology between Britain and the United States. This was part of the operation which led to the detonation of the first atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project. During the war, Charles Jocelyn Hambro's children lived in Sweden, with the Wallenberg family. During this time, they grew up together with Mark Wallenberg and Peter Wallenberg. By the middle of the war, however, they moved to the United States, to live with the Morgan family. After the war, Hambro returned to the city, assuming responsibility for the companies with which Hambro's were associated. On the death of his uncle, Olaf Hambro, in 1961 he became chairman of Hambro's bank. Whilst maintaining close connection to commerce in Scandinavia, he extended the bank's interests to Africa and Asia. Ian Robert Maxwell M.C., born Jan Ludwig Hyman Binyamin Hock, the 10th of June 1923, and dead on the 5th of November 1991, was a British media proprietor, former member of parliament, suspected spy, and fraudster. Originally from Czechoslovakia, Maxwell rose from poverty to build an extensive publishing empire. Early in his life, Maxwell, then an Orthodox Jew, escaped from Nazi occupation, joined the Czechoslovak army in exile during World War II and was decorated after active service in the British army. Maxwell used his contacts with the Allied authorities in Germany to become the managing director of the United States and the British distributor of Springer Verlag, a German publishing house for scientific journals taken over by the Allies. Maxwell was funded initially, which kicked off his quick rise to power, by Sir Charles Hambro, who gave him a checkbook and loan facilities of what would be more than £350,000 today, on no collateral, provided by the deep state. Maxwell was their man. Springer Verlag then merged with the British Butterworth Publishing Company to form the Butterworth Springer Publishing Company. Maxwell then bought three quarters of Butterworth Springer, while the remaining one quarter was bought by the Jewish scientific advisor Paul Rosbord. They then changed the company name to Pergamon Press. The sale was mediated by none other than Charles Hambro, according to British journalist Stephen Dorrell. Maxwell then led a flamboyant life, living in Headington Hill Hall in Oxford, from which he often flew in his helicopter, or sailing in his luxury yacht, the Lady Gislaine. He was litigious and often embroiled in controversy. In 1989, Maxwell had to sell successful businesses, including Pergamon Press, to cover some of his debts. In 1991, his body was discovered floating in the Atlantic Ocean, having apparently fallen overboard from his yacht. He was buried in Jerusalem. Maxwell's death triggered the collapse of his publishing empire as banks called in loans. His sons briefly attempted to keep the business together, but failed as the news emerged that Maxwell had stolen hundreds of millions of pounds from his own company's pension funds. The Maxwell companies applied for bankruptcy protection in 1992. Regardless of what the details of his death really was, the cleanup operation of his dealing started immediately. To draw attention from the fact that Maxwell was deeply in bed with the deep state, and that he almost certainly handled their blackmail operations, they used the pension funds as a diversion. Standard Operating Procedure of the Deep State
Leslie Herbert Wexner, born September 8, 1937, is an American billionaire businessman. Wexner grew a business empire after starting The Limited, a clothing retailer with a restricted selection of profitable items, and later expanded his holdings to include Victoria's Secret, Abercrombie and Fitch, Express Incorporated, and Bath and Body Works. Wexner announced, in February 2020, that he was transitioning from CEO of L Brands into the role of Chairman Emeritus. Wexner had a very close relationship with Jeffrey Epstein that began in the 1980s and continued until Epstein's death. Wexner allowed Jeffrey Epstein to run his business out of a house he owned and resided in whilst CEO of Victoria's Secret. In July 1991, Wexner granted Epstein power of attorney and also instated him as a trustee on the board of the Wexner Foundation. Access to beautiful women is an essential part to these kinds of operations. Victoria's Secret Secrets indeed. Wexner was really in the same business as Robert Maxwell. The blackmail business. Jeffrey Epstein got control over the Wexner operation in the United States around the same time as Robert Maxwell fell off his boat and drowned. The fact that Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, the daughter of Robert Maxwell, had a very strange relationship might become a little more clear after this episode. Robert Maxwell had been grooming Ghislaine from a young age to someday take over his operations. She was after all, his favorite child. He even named his yacht after her. The fact that Epstein was a disgusting molester and rapist has been put forth in the media as the aspect in focus. There is no question about that, of course he was, but we must look beyond the surface and see the big picture. In order to run this type of operation successfully, you'd have to be a pretty sick individual in the first place, and Ghislaine Maxwell is surely just as bad as Jeffrey Epstein, if not worse. To make a long story short, two arms of the blackmail businesses of the deep state was consolidated into one. Under new management. The main part of the operation probably took place at Epstein's Islands. Located in the U.S. Virgin Islands, known as Great St. James and Little St. James. These islands have been fairly untouched since Epstein's death in 2019, at least according to the media. Although we know for a fact that the FBI has combed through every square inch of them. We can speculate with pretty good certainty that whatever went on with Epstein, Maxwell and their prominent guests on the island, that everything was being filmed and recorded. Visitors to the island includes royalty, heads of state, politicians, actors, tech billionaires, musicians, scientists and so on. When Epstein died, and Maxwell went into hiding, who took control of the materials? I guess we will find out, sooner or later. We all know that Prince Andrew was deeply compromised by Epstein and Maxwell, as they trafficked young girls for his benefit. The lawsuit against Epstein and Prince Andrew by Virginia Jufri shines a light at this fact, and is aimed at laying the foundation in the public's mind, for what is coming. Let's expand a little bit more. After two travel logs from Epstein's private jet with her name on them were released by the court, British writer Clementine Clemmy Hambro, a great-granddaughter of Sir Winston Churchill, accompanied Epstein on at least two trips, one of which was to his private island. She is of course also related to Charles Jocelyn Hambro. Clementine Hambro was also a bridesmaid to Diana, Princess of Wales, at her wedding with Prince Charles. Prince Charles also had his fingers stuck deep inside the dealings of paedophile, Jimmy Savile. Savile is however another story, but perhaps similar in nature. There is also a connection between Epstein, Maxwell and the Swedish royal family. That connection goes through the Swedish deep state establishment. Barbro Enbom is the daughter of the head of department at the National Audit Office, Bertel Enbom and Dr. Astrid Gronstedt. During her career, she has worked to promote Swedish-American business collaborations, especially in life science. She has done this not only in her profession as an investment banker, but also at the Swedish-American Chamber of Commerce. Enbom has many years of experience in marketing and finance, both in the pharmaceutical industry and entrepreneurship for startup companies. Barbro Enbom graduated from the Stockholm School of Economics in 1967. 
she has pursued doctoral studies at the School of Business and Columbia University. Enbum came to work in various roles in the pharmaceutical industry and on Wall Street in the U.S. as a business leader and analyst. Among other things, she was part of the management team for companies that are today part of GlaxoSmithKline. In 2001, Enbum took the initiative to establish the Female Economist of the Year, which is a scholarship awarded annually to a prominent female student at the Stockholm School of Economics. Stockholm School of Economics, if you hadn't put that together yet, is controlled by the Wallenberg family. In the same year, Enbum founded the network BBB, Barbro's Best and Brightest for Young Ambitious Women, initially only for business school students but then expanded to women from other universities and other areas of activity. Today, there are more than 200 members within BBB. The scholarship received the equivalent of at least 1.5 million Swedish kroner in donations from Jeffrey Epstein between 2001 and 2014. Stockholm School of Economics terminated its collaboration with Enbum in 2020, in connection with remarks about the female economist of the year's connection to Jeffrey Epstein. In 2022, accusations were made that Enbum had invited several scholarship recipients to meet Epstein. As his conviction was made public the school downplayed his involvement and continued receiving money. Barbro Enbom, the founder of the scholarship, repeatedly invited young Swedish women to Epstein's luxury home in New York. Dress code. Bare legs. Swedish newspaper Dagens etc. revealed new information regarding the decisions made by the School of Economics and confirmed that Epstein approached several of these Swedish women, urging them to find new potential victims. Another way to put it is that they were testing these women to see who could be useful in the blackmail business. High moral fiber is not something that they look for. Like we've said before, access to beautiful women is essential especially if you can find those with questionable morals. What is the connection to the Swedish royal family? On June 27, 2014, the court announced Swedish Prince Carl Philip and Sophia Helpvist's engagement. The couple had met in Bostad, five years earlier, and Sophia was already considered part of the family. The woman who made sure that Sophia had ample coaching before the marriage with the Swedish prince was Barbro Enbom. Barbro Embam had for a long time been Princess Sophia's mentor. They still have close contact and Embam is always a guest, when the prince and princess have large parties. Just coincidences, of course. The blackmail business of the deep state is a very old phenomenon. Just to make this very clear, how surprised would you be if we could trace this type of business further back in time? Well, let's give it a go. In 1895, Oscar Wilde brought the Marquis of Queensbury to court, charging him with defamation. The Marquis of Queensbury was the father of Lord Alfred Douglas, with whom he accused Oscar Wilde of having a homosexual relationship. Homosexuality was illegal at the time and the Marquis had repeatedly tried to bring these activities to light. However, the attorneys for the prosecuted provided evidence that the Marquis' accusations against Wilde for sodomy were justified, and the Marquis was acquitted, at the same time as Wilde was charged with gross indecency, and sentenced to two years of penal labor, together with his partner Alfred Taylor. During the trial, it was revealed that Oscar Wilde had extensive contact with extortionists, male prostitutes, crossdressers, and was a frequent visitor to gay brothels. Many were registered and various people involved were interviewed, some being forced to appear as witnesses, because they were also linked to the crimes for which Wilde was charged. During the ongoing trial, many young men from the English aristocracy fled the country to avoid scandal, and one of these men was none other than Claude Danzi, who would become head of the British intelligence service during the Second World War. As we can see, that at the time of Oscar Wilde, the extortion business was already in full swing. Oscar Wilde eventually ending up in a situation where an extortion attempt went wrong, and he landed himself in prison, for fornication with other men. After Oscar Wilde's death in the year 1900, his body was moved in 1908, to the Pelakis Cemetery in Paris, after it was revealed that an anonymous donor donated £2,000 to a grave monument. 
The stone was designed as a sphinx, a guardian sculpture where the word originates from the Greek word sphingo, meaning secret keeper, or someone who knows but is not telling. Who was the sculptor of the statue? A certain Jacob Epstein. History has a way of repeating itself. The blackmail business has been a huge and very real part by which the deep state has controlled men and women in powerful positions. To think that anyone could get into a position where they could be a threat to the deep state is not just naive, it's totally out of the question. How do you beat an opponent that has rigged the game, cheats, murders and lies? 1. Unrig the game. 2. Take away their ability to cheat. 3. Take away their toys. 4. Expose the lies. 5. Have them face justice. The best is yet to come. And nothing can stop what is coming. Thank you for listening.